Okay, so hello, welcome back. So today we're going to go into the Open Nebula uh, side uh, of the module. So uh, first of all, uh, by this point you should be finished with uh, VMware and VirtualBox. Uh, if you haven't, this week is the last week that you can actually dedicate to these labs. It's all right. Uh, I think some of you will have finished already, which is uh, great. You can go straight into Open Nebula. Uh, some of you will be, it's, it's okay to actually dedicate this week and make sure that you finish everything with regards to uh, VMware and VirtualBox itself. So with regards to Open Nebula, today is a, a very theoretical intro with uh, regards to what the cloud is and how Open Nebula actually handles this concept and how you can build the cloud in Open Nebula. So we'll talk a little bit about the basic principles of uh, a cloud system and then I will explain all of the aspects of Open Nebula as a software and as a cloud solution, how it actually works. So the idea is that you build a cloud in order to uh, service your users. So you're supposed to have a resource in place so that you can actually have some users and they need to do their job. Okay, so they need to uh, get onto the system and work so then you have available resources in order to use. Now, in order to do this, there are a few things that we need to take into consideration. Uh, Open Nebula itself is a bottom-up approach design, as they call it. So essentially, it's built with the user needs in mind. So essentially, you will have the users in your company or your institution or whatever, and you need to figure out exactly what they do. So how they use the computers in the company, how they use the resources that you want to provide them, and then actually go ahead and provide that to them. So in a sense, uh, you need to build your cloud around uh, the needs of your users. So this really translates into uh, what sort of uh, CPU power everybody needs, what sort of memory requirements they have, what sort of hardware space requirements they have in order to store all the data that they're using, and so on. Now, in order to do this, you need to uh, decide basic uh, components of all of the infrastructure that you will build. So you will build a system, and that system needs to be able to correspond to the needs of your users. There are several criteria to this. So you will have the infrastructure components, such as networking, storage, authorization, and virtualization backends. So you will need to have uh, all of the infrastructure uh, in the back that users don't actually see and don't actually use but it can actually support what the users are doing with it. Uh, you need to have a plan dimension of the cloud, so characteristics of the workload, number of users and so on, so how many CPU cores you need in total, what sort of RAM everybody needs and so on, and the provisioning workflow, i.e. how uh, end users are going to be uh, isolated and using the cloud. So it's not just the idea of how many resources, so how much CPU or RAM or hardware space you can provide to the users, it's the whole idea behind the providing a complete solution for everybody to be able to work and all of the infrastructure that is behind all of that so that they can actually do their work uninterrupted and without any issues whatsoever. Now, uh, there are various features uh, in Open Nebula. Open Nebula mostly, uh, by default, really is a cloud-based uh, provider and it's based on KVM. It can support uh, vCenter as a hypervisor as well, and it can support other third-party uh, hypervisors as well, but KVM is the default, and this is because it was developed for Linux, and surprise, surprise, this is what we're using with our Red Hat CentOS uh, deployments. Our default hypervisor is KVM. That's why when you were building, uh, that's why when you uh, have your Prometheus virtual machine, it already has KVM visualization enabled inside it. So if you type ifconfig and you see the VIRBR network card, that's what it is. Okay. So the architecture of it, essentially you want to create a data center. And in the end, you can have multiple different data centers with different purposes in life. So depending on the structure of the company that you're working for, the complexity, the number of users and everything else, you can have one data center that will handle everything, or you can have little different virtual data centers that will basically be split across different types of users and uh, different departments, for example, in the company that they want to do whatever they want to do. And you can manage this separately or have multiple administrators managing all of these individually. 
As far as the architectural overview, the basic components that we need in order to have an open Ebola cloud are pretty much this uh, schematic here. So the first thing that we need is a front end. So we need to have a computer, a machine, that runs the Open Nebula front end. So it runs the demo, the scheduler, and everything else. So one of these machines in the cloud, or it can even be a machine that is outside the cloud somewhere else, it has to be the front end. It has to be the manager that says, okay, I will now start up a virtual machine, or now we we'll build a new template for a virtual machine, and so on. You will then need hypervisor-enabled hosts that provide the resources needed by the VMs. When we say resources needed by the VMs, we're speaking mostly about CPU cores and RAM. Okay, so you have a bunch of servers without many CPU cores and all of the virtualization extensions that they can support and as much memory as they can support as well. They don't need to have hard drive space in this particular instance because we simply need some computers, some servers that can run some virtual machines so they can start them up and use their CPU and memory. For storage, we need to have data stores. So the data stores hold the <coughs> images for all of the VMs. So this is essentially your hard drive space in the cloud. There are different types of data stores that OpenEvula uses and most cloud solutions use as well. And we'll explain these later on. And you will finally need physical networks that are used to support basic services such as interconnection of the storage servers and open envelope control operations and VLANs for the VMs. So you need to have a network that takes you to the outside world from the cloud. You also need to have a service network that connects all of the different components of the cloud with each other because you will have a storage server somewhere uh, that will contain all of the storage space that needs to be connected with some sort of network to the VMs so that the VMs can actually use the storage space so to need to connect to the host that can start those VMs and all of this needs to be able to communicate with the front end because the front end will manage everything. This is in a normal deployment. Okay, so you would have the various components, the storage server, which is called the data stores, uh, the hosts and the front end and everything will be connected with the network. In our case, in the lab, all of these roles will be filled by your Prometheus virtual machine. So this simplifies and changes things a little bit. Okay, in the sense that everything will be hosted by one computer, so the front end and the virtualization host will be your Prometheus virtual machine. So there's no need for a service network between them because it's the same thing. All right, so your Prometheus will you have installed Open Nebula and it has virtualization capabilities with KVM already, so it will be the virtualization host as well, and it will be the front end as well. We're also going to use Prometheus's 200 gigabytes of space in order to host our data stores there. So storage will also be based there. So again, we don't need another network to connect a storage server to our front end and the virtualization hosts. The only networks that we will need essentially will be the physical network that connects us to the outside world so that your network card in S33 that's on network 28 that connects Prometheus to the outside world and everything inside it will be connected i.e. the hosts that we start up the virtual machines that we start up they will only need the VM networks so we will build a virtual networking infrastructure which is similar to the VMnet network cards that we had with VMware, for example. But this time it's going to be built with something called OpenV Switch, uh, which is another technology that uh, we use for Open Nebula. Okay, so we have the outside network that connects the cloud to the outside world, and then we have the inside virtual network that will connect all of our virtualized hosts with each other if we want to, and with the front end and the outside world through it. Now, how do we actually give a size? How do we actually dimension a cloud? So how do we decide what resources actually need to be uh, allocated to the computers that we're using for whatever purpose they have? The first thing we need to worry about is the OpenEvula front end. So somewhere in our data center, in our cloud deployment, 
we have a computer, a server, or two if we want a backup for this, that will actually run Open Nebula itself. Open Nebula itself has software. It is not very demanding at all. It's about 150 megabytes in size in installation. And it requires two gigabytes of RAM, one CPU core, 100 gigabytes of space, and two network cards. The inside network card that talks to all of the VMs and everything, and the outside network card that talks to the outside world. The maximum number of uh, servers or virtualization hosts that this can host varies wildly. So you can have 500 servers, 1,000 servers, or we could actually connect all of the computers in this floor and set them up as virtualization hosts for an open API client. Okay. It really just depends on the size of the implementation, and Open Nebula can handle quite a lot of them. So you shouldn't be worried about the software itself doing its job just with the one virtualization host that you will have, no matter how small or big the resources are on it actually. The KVM nodes that we need in the cloud, basically, the first thing that we care about is CPU. So we care about how many cores we can have to our virtual machines. Now there is something here called overcommitment that we can do. So we can commit more resources to the existing CPUs in place, knowing or assuming that they will not always be used at the full capacity. So when a server does something or when a user uses a virtual machine to do something, they don't have the CPU running at 100% utilization all the time, do they? In fact, statistically, it's even less than half of that most of the time. All right, so you can actually overcommit. You can say that, you know, I have a system that has 1,000 cores. I will create 2,000 virtual machines with one core each. So this happens in Open Nebula with the CPU and the vCPU values that we can have. We can have an actual CPU core, and we have virtual CPU cores that we can assign to the virtual machines, and we can pretty much do whatever we want. So we can give 0.2 of a core to a virtual machine and get it to work, or we can give one physical core and two virtual CPU cores in that virtual machine and let it work and see what that. All right, so it's very flexible in that sense. We cannot do the same for memory. So for memory planning, uh, it's more straightforward. There's no overcommitment. All you need to do is basically decide what your machine needs and give an extra 10% for everything in there to actually work. So all of the uh, management demons and everything else uh, with uh, regards to the cloud to actually work and do what it needs to do. Storage. So the way that the storage works in Open Nebula is we have uh, two basic data stores. So we have the image data store and the system data store. So when you create a virtual machine in Open Nebula, you essentially create a template for that virtual machine. So you have a script, a file that says, I am a virtual machine. I have two CPU cores, I have four gigabytes of RAM, and I have these images that are used by me. So an image that is used by me can be a blank hard drive, or which is empty space, or it can be a hard drive with an operating system, or it has to be a hard drive with an operating system, at least one of them, that actually has the operating system of the virtual machine installed and running inside it. it another image can be a DVD disk, for example, or an ISO image for a DVD, and so on and so forth. So these images are stored in the image data store. So when you create a template, space is allocated for the images that the template contains in the image data store. When you run a virtual machine in the cloud, those images are usually copied, cloned, onto the system data store. So the system data store holds what is actually running in the system, because you can have a bunch of virtual machines defined in your cloud, but they, may, they will be either powered off or they can be de-instantiated completely. So they can exist as a concept in the cloud, but not actually running anywhere. Or they can exist in the cloud, and they can be running on the system, so they can be loaded into the cloud, they can be loaded into active memory, and their images can exist on the system data store, and you can boot them up whenever you want. Okay, so there are various different states that the virtual machine can exist in, in a cloud, and we'll see this later on in the third lab set in more detail. But the idea is that when you create a virtual machine, it leaves 
in the EMAS data store, but when you run it, it gets copied onto the system data store and it runs from there. As for the network, there are several uh, recommendations as to what you should have. The bare minimum, so which, what we have, is two network cards. One network card that connects to the outside world, and one network card that gives you access to the inside world, to the virtual networks that you will usually bridge onto that one, so that you can give access to all of the virtual machines that are running in that, in that host. So the implementation that we will make will actually be the simplest implementation of them all because everything is running on the same computer, on the same server. In fact, inside the virtual machine on the server. Now, the front end in Open Nebula consists of the management daemon, which is called 1D, and this is the one thing that must always be running correctly, if anything, and the scheduler, which is basically the process that tells the system, ah, look, this virtual machine is running, or this virtual machine needs to start, or this virtual machine needs to be transferred back into the image data store because it's set down, and so on and so forth. There is a web interface server, which is called Sandstone. If you're a real hardcore, you don't even need to use this. You can do everything on a command line interface, so you can manage the entire cl cloud without having a graphical inter user interface. And in fact, you should, you would really, uh, in order to have a minimum footprint of your front-end server onto your installation, onto your cloud. And then after that, you have other advanced components like OneFlow, OneGate, and so on. Now, the way all of this is monitored is with the MM set, the scheduler, basically, is you have a system in place that basically informs your Open Nebula front-end, your 1D, of the current running status of your cloud. So if virtual machines are running, how many CPU cores they need, how much they're actually utilizing at the moment, how much memory, which images are being used, and which data store they're being used, uh, which network cards are in use by which virtual machine, and so on. So all of this information is periodically reported back onto OpenEpilo, onto 1D, and that can actually produce all of the information that you get, for example, on the dashboard when you uh, actually see the system running in Open Nebula. Now, this depends on all of the individual components working well with each other. So, for example, one of the classic things that can go wrong is because different nodes, different hosts communicate with each other via passwordless SSH. If you don't set this up correctly in the beginning, then the monitoring will not be successful between the different components of everything and then services and uh, other provisions will actually fail in one day. Okay, so they, it's very important that they all work very well and they work well with each other. Now the virtualization hosts themselves in a cloud, they basically need to be a bunch of servers sitting on a rack providing CPU and RAM to the system. Okay, in our case, it's only our Prometheus virtual machine that we're dealing with because it's just a proof of concept that we're building here. Nothing more. The most important thing is that those virtualization hosts support some virtualization technology. So they have a CPU that is capable to basically run virtual machines. So in our situation, your Prometheus virtual machine is very important that on the settings of the Prometheus virtual machine, the Intel VTX box is checked. If that box is not checked, then it means that your virtual machine as such does not support the virtualization extensions that the CPU on your computer has, because I mean, that's the reason why we have Xeons and not i5s or i7s. Okay, so we need to make sure that your Prometheus supports all of the virtualization extensions that are needed from the cloud in order to operate. And this is very, very important, and I'll tell you something cool that we realized a couple of weeks ago on my project students. We do have a cloud, and I will show you in detail later on, it's inside there. The virtual machines themselves, so the host, the virtualization hosts, support all of the virtualization extensions, but when they were built in Grub, one of those extensions was not mentioned. So my student built the cloud as the base, and then he tried to build another Open Nebula installation inside it. So two nested Open Nebula installations, and the second one would say, no, there's no virtualization capability. 
This is because this was just a configuration problem with GrabbleConf, with something very basic and something very weird. And I'm very impressed that they should actually figure this out. So yes, the virtualization extensions and the capabilities of the CPU is one of the most important components of a virtualization host in order to bring into, into the game so that we can run our virtual machines without any problems. The storage itself is very important that it communicates correctly with the host. When you start up a virtual machine, it needs to be able to read the images that it needs uh, so that they can run with uh, good enough speed onto the system. So in order for this to happen, the service network or the underlying infrastructure needs to be there and it needs to be correct. Of course, we don't need to worry about this too much because in our specific implementation, everything is on the same computer, so we're okay. However, in normal implementations, this is a very big part of it. There are different technologies that you can have. You can have fiber, everything else, uh, in order to make this as fast as possible so that your virtual machines run as fast as possible inside the cloud itself. So there are da different data stores. So the system and the image data store, there is also a file data store, which is basically used in order to store normal uh, files. So it can be plain files uh, or, and not disk images. Uh, it can be used to store kernels, run this or context files. The most important of this to know is that the context file is essentially customization that you can provide to a virtual machine once it starts. So you build the virtual machine, you configure the operating system inside it. You can have this same virtual machine configured with different contextualization files and they can change the network card settings, they can change the software that is installed on those virtual machines, the way that those virtual machines behave, the authentication that they can take, and so on and so forth. So it all depends on the context file themselves. The file system itself for those images and everything else. Uh, there are different technologies available again. It all depends on what you're using it for. Uh, because we are using local storage, we'll go with the most flexible found file system that they have, which is basically called QCOW. And you can look into this and see exactly what it is. Networking itself. The most important components are the service network, which is used for the opening of front end to access hosts in order to manage and monitor everything uh, and we have the instance network which basically gives network connectivity to the virtual machines across uh, across the cloud and to the outside world in our implementation this is simplified and we only need to use to use one virtual network or essentially we don't need a service network because everything runs on the same host okay the hosts and the front end are the same host and so it's the storage data stores as well and we just need to have the instance network that offers connectivity to the outside world, to your virtual machines. There are different types of networking again that can be used. We will be using OV switch, over the switch, because it really is the, the most flexible way to do networking, and you can do lots and lots of things with it uh, inside Open Network. Authentication, we will use no more built-in user password, but of course you can have a SSH application, you can use LDAP later on, yeah, a serious system, and so on. There are some advanced components that are available as well, but I put this here only for information for you, so you don't need to worry about them too much. So the idea is that you will build a cloud system inside each of your virtual machines. It will have all of the components that are needed for a cloud to operate. Okay. It will just be a simplified version of uh, what that cloud actually looks like. So, I'd like to ask, now that there's more of you here, uh, how many of you have finished with VMware and VirtualBox and would like to start on Open Nebula this week? Hands up. Okay, so I will quickly explain uh, the setup uh, labs it as well. And I think we will probably explain it next week, though. So, also, if you go on Moodle, there is a link to the Open Nebula documentation as well. Uh, the lab sheets are based on this. Okay, so all of the Open Nebula lab sheets that I have, the information that I'm getting are from there. So, front end installation, uh, management operations, all of that is basically taken from this. It's a very comprehensive guide that they've done. 
okay? So if you ever need anything to figure out everything, something you don't understand, just go in here and in here and have a search. So as for the setup itself, okay, so what we will be doing, uh, we will start with the front end installation. So we will install the OpenEbula software onto our Prometheus virtual machine. Now, in order to do this, the easiest way to do it is to actually tell the operating system where the installation files are located. So we need to create a custom repository, as we call it, the repo, and it's going to be the Open Nebula repo in our system. So we need to go into etc. yamrepos.d and create an Open Nebula repo, and that needs to contain all of this information as it is here exactly, as in to the to the spaces that are in this, they need to be correct. Okay, so the safest way for you to do this is to actually take, copy and paste all of this and paste it into a text file. Ideally, I would like you to paste it into a terminal based text file like VI or NANO or something like that because you won't have any characters from PDF or from the HTML uh, that you're getting it from. Once you have that file, you need to tell the system to update its repository cache so that it knows where all the information is and it can search for it. And then once you do this, yum install should do the trick. So you need to install the OpenEbula server, which is the main component, the OpenEbula Sandstone, which is the web interface for it, and you also need to install Gate and Flow, which are optional components that are needed by OpenEbula for it to work. Once you do this, you can SU a system as user one admin onto the system, because you can install the system you install the software, so that has created a user code to an admin. And the first step is to set up the password for this user. Now, the password is stored in uh, the local directory in value 1, if I remember correctly, and it's in a dot one one of file. You should only edit this file once in your lines. Okay, so make sure you do this. Make sure that it is localhost one. You can open the file itself and check that it says one admin dot dot localhost one and exit. You shouldn't try to change the one admin password after you've run Open Nebula as a service. You can change it, but you need to do it in a different way because this builds the database that holds all the user information once you run the service. So you cannot just go back and edit this file. So this file, editing it manually like this, is, is a simple process to get things going before we actually start with the OpenEvila running itself. So you exit, you exit this. The next step that you need to do before you run the service is you need to edit the sandstoneserver.com file. So this is a configuration file that basically tells us, tells OpenEvila and tells Sandstone which services to run and how to do everything once it runs. We need to disable something called Fire Edge. It's another management interface. We don't need it. We will be using everything through Sandstone itself. So all you need to do is put a hashtag in front of the last two lines of that file, those files that talk about Fire Edge. That will disable Fire Edge from running for OpenEbula. Once you do this, you start the Open Nebula and you start Open Nebula Sunstone as well. The service should now be running. You shouldn't get any warning messages or anything back from that. It should just give you a new prompt uh, terminal. And then you can verify the installation. So in the terminal, you just do one user show. So that command will show you all of the users that the Open Nebula uh, demo knows about. And it should say, yes, I have a user with ID 0. It's the first user. His name is one admin. He has a password or whatever the encrypted version of it, and so core authentication and the user's name. All right. So this would be the first sign, the first proof that you've installed Open Nebula, and it actually runs, and it has a user called one admin, and that admin user for that software. The other way to check is to point your browser onto localhost 9869, and that should take you to the Open Nebula web interface. So that should take you to Sandstone, and you should be able to log in there as one admin with password of localhost one and get to the dashboard of your system. 
there is a directory structure here as well, so that you know where everything is. So uh, essentially, it's it's a cheat sheet so that you know where everything is basically located. So you don't actually need to do anything about this. Just make sure that if you need to find where out where something is located, and you will later on. This is how you actually find it. And then you need to enable the node installation. So if this was a big deployment, this would happen on a different computer. All right. So you install the OpenAbular node KVM to whoever computer, to whichever server you want to be your host for your cloud. All right. So in our cloud, for example, we have about 24 of these hosts. So we have installed this 24 times on 24 different computers. In our case, we're just turning our Prometheus VM into a virtualization host, yum install, service lead the restart, so that's the service responsible for all virtualization uh, actions in the system itself, and then that should be it. Another important aspect of the configuration that you need to do is you need to en enable passwordless SSH. So the user one admin and all of the individual components of the service itself should be able to communicate between the front end and the virtualization host passwordlessly. Yes, I know that it's the same computer for us. However, the system will do SSH 127001 as user one admin. So that needs to be able to happen without being asked for a password. So all you need to do is you need to change the config file in the dot SSH in the hidden folder of the settings of the user one admin. And you need to make sure that it has for all host, host star, you should not be checking for a host key, so you stick host key checking no, and there should be no user known host file used. So these three lines need to be present in the .ssh slash config file inside one admin's home directory. Once you do that, you need to change the permissions of this config file, so it's mode 600 to it, so that you have the right permissions for everything you want to do. And then you can verify that it works with SSH localhost. You should just get the prompt back and say, yes, I mean, thank you very much. It shouldn't ask you for a password. If it does, there's something wrong. That's something wrong 99.9% of the times is going to be a typo something. Okay, so try to have as minimum interaction with this file as possible. Change as, as few things as possible. Don't add the lines here and there. Just make sure that you add only these particular three lines if they are not there already, and that's it. Once you do that as well, again, you can try and verify again that you can log in onto your system web, web interface and that everything works, and then that's it. Okay, so it's a relatively simple process. You just need to be very careful of typos, essentially, the way that the lab set is built. Okay, so that you don't get any problems with SSH. The most, the number one problem that you'll have is that later on when you go inside your cloud and you try to add a virtualization host, which will be your Prometheus, it will say error. And that error will 99% of the time will be a problem with your passwordless SSH or even a typo or something in the name of the virtualization host, which should be Prometheus NetLab or TCVK anyway. Okay, so it's pretty simple to install it and get it to run. All right, just be careful of all of the individual steps that you do on this. So I will stop this now because we don't need it for anymore.